the Son of God, loved me and gave himself for me. Jesus once said, Greater love has no man than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. Jesus had had no rest and no food since he had left the upper room where he celebrated the Passover with his disciples. His eyes would almost certainly be bloodshot and puffy, his brow bleeding. Maybe men's saliva still clung to his beard. And he would have aged noticeably as Pilate brought him before the crowd and made his now famous proclamation. Behold the man. Maybe his mother and his followers, if they had joined the crowd by this time, had difficulty in recognising him. Already weakened by all he had suffered, Jesus now faced a further humiliation. As always during the Passover celebrations, Pilate invited the Jews to choose which prisoner he should release. The choice lay between Barabbas, who had been imprisoned for murder and insurrection, and Jesus. Which one do you want me to release to you? asked the governor. Barabbas! they answered. What shall I do then with Jesus, who is called Christ? Pilate asked. They all answered, Crucify him! Pilate continued to plead Jesus' innocence, but the mob clambered all the more loudly, Crucify him! Crucify him! Whereupon Pilate literally washed his hands of the whole affair and discovered later that to wash one's hands of God is not as easy as he thought. Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you for all the benefits you have won for us, for all the pains and insults you have borne for us, most merciful Redeemer, friend and brother, may we know you more clearly, love you more dearly, and follow you more nearly, day by day. Jesus once said to his disciples, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sake of his sheep. I lay down my life. No one is taking it from me, but I lay it down of my own free will. This is the backdrop against which the passion drama is enacted. After Pilate had washed his hands of Jesus, he handed him over to his captors, who evidently loaded Jesus with his cross. Then the soldiers of the government took Jesus into the governor's headquarters, and they gathered the whole cohort around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him, and after twisting some thorns into a crown, they put it on his head. They put a reed in his right hand and knelt before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! They spat on him, and they took the reed and struck him on the head. After mocking him, they stripped him of the robe and put his own clothes on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. Staggering under the weight of the wood, Jesus was lined up with two convicted criminals and a cohort of Roman soldiers. And as they leave the centre of Jerusalem in convoy, we watch the body of Jesus sway under the weight of the crossbeam as he makes the first steps on this last lap of the journey. Yet the forlorn figure 
does not plead for pity from us. He is the Good Shepherd, who is giving his life voluntarily for us, his sheep. He yearns for the gratitude which is born of the realisation that he is stumbling to Golgotha for me. Suffering Saviour, help me to understand and feel the depth of your love for me. May it draw from me an appropriate response. Jesus falls. He before whom all things quake and tremble, to whom every tongue gives praise, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God, is struck on the face by the priests, and they give him gold to drink. Yet he was pleased to suffer all things, wishing to save us from our sins by his own blood, in his love for mankind. This is how the Orthodox Church sums up the awesome mystery we are contemplating this week. As he continued his rescue bid, Jesus continued to travel in convoy with the convicted criminals, flanked on all sides by spear-carrying Roman soldiers. The condemned wound their way along the narrow, uneven paths of Jerusalem. The sun would have been high in the sky by this time. The heat intense. The pathetic procession could move only slowly, partly because Jesus was too weak to hurry, and partly because people would have been lining the streets of this heavy populated part of the city. The armed soldiers and the centurion, who headed the procession on horseback, would have controlled the crowd with their spears, but they could do nothing to control the body of Jesus. It would appear that he lost balance, lurched forward and fell, unable to steady himself because his hands were still bound by rope and burdened by the big beam. Neither could they compel Jesus to continue to carry his own cross. Strength had ebbed from him. He was powerless, like someone with a slip, who has had a slipped disc whose body seems locked and full of pain. Instead, they came across a man from Cyrene and forced him to carry the cross. As they went out, they came upon a man from Cyrene named Simon. They compelled this man to carry his cross. The Gospel writers do not actually give details of such a fall, but it seems probable that this was the reason why Simon of Cyrene was coerced into carrying Christ's cross. The Bible does, however, describe how Jesus was probably feeling at this stage of the journey. We read in Psalm 22. My strength has drained away like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart melts like wax. My strength has been dried up like a sun-baked clay. My tongue sticks to my mouth. For you have laid me in the dust of death. O oh Lord, don't stay away. O oh God, my strength, hurry to my aid.
Jesus' reaction to the woman of Jerusalem must surely have surprised everyone. In all probability, these women were part of an organised group who were called the Charitable Women of Jerusalem. They were official mourners, people with permission to offer sedative drinks to condemned criminals. When they saw Jesus dragging one foot after the other along the road, they seemed to have genuine pity on him. Their tears seemed to have been real tears of sorrow. Yet Jesus summons the strength to say to them, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me. Weep rather for yourselves and for your children. Even the most selfless person, when suffering, finds it hard to think of anything but their own pain. Not so Jesus. Despite his physical frailty, he seems to have ignored his own pain and concerned himself with the anguish these women and their children would suffer when Jerusalem was razed to the ground and those who survived the atrocities were taken into exile. Lord, thousands of children have been herded into refugee camps where they live separated from their mothers. Thousands of children have lost their mothers through war and famine, floods and earthquakes. Thousands of families climb into boats where they starve because they cannot find a hospitable port. The big brown eyes of these children stare out at me. I can count their ribs, but I don't know how to respond to wave after wave of such human tragedy. Show me what I can do, then help me to do it. The procession reaches its destination, Golgotha, the place which looked like a skull, the place of execution. There they stripped Jesus in the way that the psalmist had once foretold. The enemy, this gang of evil men, circles me like a pack of dogs. They have pierced my hands and feet. I can count every bone in my body. See these men of evil gloat and stare. They divide my clothes among themselves by a toss of the dice. The soldiers did just that. The soldiers threw dice to divide up his clothes among themselves. Then they sat around and watched as he hung there. The soldiers were not the only ones to leer. The bystanders, it seemed, were equally intent on humiliating Jesus. As he hung, naked from his cross, they ridiculed him. And the people passing by hurled abuse, shaking their heads at him and saying, So, you can destroy the temple and build it up again in three days, can you? Well then, come on down from the cross if you are the Son of God. Your flesh was lacerated, and I am healed. Hallelujah to you, Lord Jesus. Having stripped Jesus of his clothes, they crucified him. Canon Peter Green, 
invites us to picture the scene. The cross is laid on the ground. Jesus is stripped and thrown roughly onto it. Nails are driven through each hand and foot. The cross is jerked up, throwing the whole weight of the body upon tortured hands and feet. Then with a sickening jar, the cross is dropped into the hole prepared for it, and wedges of wood are driven in to stay and support it. Each blow of the hammer sending pain and agony through the whole body of the Lord. And he meets each blow with the often repeated prayer, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. The Greek makes it quite plain that this was a word not spoken once. The text should be translated, Jesus kept on saying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That prayer of Jesus must surely be one of the most moving on record. It also gives us a glimpse of the victory he was winning on Calvary's tree. While soldiers were in the act of crucifying him, while he was being mocked and ridiculed, and while the events of Judas's betrayal, Peter's denial, the disciples' desertion, were still fresh in his memory. Jesus seems to plead with the Father. Abba, loose them, let them go. Set them free to become the people you always intended them to be. Release them from the tyranny of self-pleasing. Restore them to their birthright, to oneness with you, for which they were created. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Jesus was not crucified alone. Two convicted criminals were killed with him. They would have walked to Calvary in convoy with Jesus. They would have watched him fall, seen how Simon of Cyrene was compelled to carry his cross. And they would have been aware that Jesus was unlike most men facing crucifixion. Jesus behaved more like the most heroic of martyrs. When he spoke, it was in words like the prayer we meditated on. Father, forgive them. Yet the thieves reacted very differently to Jesus. One of the criminals, hanging there, hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. The other one, however, rebuked him, saying, Don't you fear God? You received the same sentence he did. Ours, however, is only right, because we are getting what we deserve for what we did. But he has done no wrong. And he said to Jesus, Remember me, Jesus, when you come as king. Jesus said to him, I promise you that today... You will be in paradise with me. The penitent thief had read no books about the meaning of Christ's death, yet he instinctively reached out to Jesus and was accepted. When Luke recorded this incident in his Gospel, was he trying to assure us that it is never too late to enjoy God's forgiveness? Was he also trying to underline that no crime is so serious that it need keep us from experiencing God's love?
I may not know. I cannot tell what pains you had to bear. But I believe it was for me. You hung and suffered there. Just before noon, on the first Good Friday, before the light was to go from the sun and darkness was to envelop the world, Jesus became acutely aware of his mother, who was standing with the beloved disciple at the foot of the cross. He said to his mother, Here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, She is your mother. From that time the disciple took her to live in his home. From the moment Mary had received God's invitation to become the mother of the Messiah, she had said her yes to God, and at great cost to herself, had devoted herself to Jesus. She had not always fully understood his mission, but she had stayed by him, and here she was, loving him to the bitter end. As the end drew rapidly near, Mary was to need the support of John. The prophet Simeon had warned her that sorrow, like a sharp sword, will break your own heart. That surely must have been happening as darkness fell, and as she heard her much-loved son complain of thirst, before screaming out to his father, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It must have felt as though someone was turning the sword in her own wound when she watched Jesus slump forward and die before her very eyes. But the memory of that beautiful moment when he noticed her and met her need, despite his own anguish and pain, must have stayed with her forever and brought some degree of comfort in this desolation of the next day. Lord, give me the grace to follow your example. Create in me the desire and the will to put the needs of others before my own, even when I am hurting. What convinced the penitent thief that Jesus was the Messiah? Was it the way Jesus bore his suffering, refusing the pain-deadening draught of cheap wine, expressing forgiveness for his torturers, showing concern for those who could not cope with the sight of his scars? Or was it the majestic silence with which he absorbed the insults and jeers of the soldiers and other bystanders? We shall never know. We do know that the penitent thief was not the only one to realise God's touch that day. The army officer on duty at the scene of the crucifixion had a similar experience. At noon, the whole country was covered with darkness, which lasted for three hours. At three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud shout, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why did you abandon me? Some of the people there heard him and said, Listen, he's calling for Elijah. One of them ran up with a sponge, soaked it in cheap wine, 
and put it on the end of a stick, then held it up to Jesus' lips and said, Wait, let us see if Elijah is coming to bring him down from the cross. With a loud cry, Jesus died. The army officer who was standing there in front of the cross saw how Jesus had died. This man was really the Son of God, he said. This army officer had been in charge of the soldiers Pilate commanded to flog Jesus. But this man's heart would have been hardened to such savage scenes. He would almost certainly have accompanied Jesus as he staggered from Jerusalem to Golgotha. But the experience was not new. He had walked that way with the condemned many times. When springtime comes to the countryside, the silence of winter is broken by the tell-tale sound of dripping water as the sun melts snow and ice. When springtime comes to the centurion, his hard-heartedness was melted. Scales fell from his eyes and he realised that Jesus was what he professed to be, God's Son. Such revelations are a sign that the Holy Spirit is at work. His is the task of showing us the truth about Jesus. Spirit of the Living God Fall afresh on me. Break me. Melt me. Mould me. Fill me. Jesus has died. His body was broken for us. His side was pierced and his blood shed for us. After the soldier had pierced the side of the Saviour, Joseph of Arimathea, who had been a secret disciple of Jesus for fear of the Jewish leaders, boldly asked Pilate for permission to take Jesus' body down and Pilate told him to go ahead. So he came and took it away. Nicodemus, the man who had come to Jesus at night, came too, bringing a hundred pounds of embalming ointment made from myrrh and aloes. Together they wrapped Jesus' body in a long linen cloth, saturated with spices, as is the Jewish custom of burial. The place of crucifixion was near a grove of trees where there was a new tomb never used before. And so, because of the need for haste before the Sabbath and because the tomb was close at hand, they laid him there. When Nicodemus first made his secretive nighttime visit to Jesus, he heard the words which must now echo round the world. God loved the world so much that he gave his one and only Son so that anyone who believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Lord, I believe.